What causes someone to develop scoliosis? Yesterday I presented the case of a 57 year old man who came to my office with complaints of chronic lower back pain and ongoing pain radiating down his right leg. He found that over time he was having a harder time standing up straight and his family noticed in pictures he was often leaning to the side. He has what's called adult degenerative scoliosis. He's been dealing with this pain for quite some time, but it seems to have gotten progressive over the years. He's done a multitude of conservative treatment, including physical therapy, visits to the chiropractor, multiple injections, and has even resorted to surgery. He had severe spinal stenosis due to the curvature in his spine and underwent a laminectomy. This is a procedure where we go in and clean out around the nerves in the lower back, and it helps some of the symptoms, but after the laminectomy, some of the symptoms even gotten worse. He even began to develop weakness in his foot. June is Scoliosis Awareness Month, so let's talk about the variety of different types of scoliosis because they're not all the same. This picture shows you the different types of scoliosis and how it can affect different parts of the spine. Our patient has lumbar scoliosis. The other question that tends to come up is how does one even get scoliosis? There are also different types of scoliosis that depends on which age group you're in. There is congenital scoliosis that happens from birth, and that's because the bones within the spine maybe didn't form quite right. There's also a type of scoliosis called idiopathic adolescent scoliosis, which I talked about a few weeks ago. This is the kind of scoliosis that's commonly checked for in school, and it typically happens during the growth spurt. And then there's a type of scoliosis that I'm talking about, which is adult degenerative scoliosis. When we're looking at someone from the front to back view, the spine is meant to be straight. It's designed like that to keep your head exactly proportional over your feet so we can maintain an equal gravitational dispersion of forces across the spine. Looking at the spine from the side view, there are normal types of curvatures that exist in the spine. We typically have a lordosis in the neck, a kyphosis in the thoracic spine, and then a lordosis in the lumbar spine. So it's almost like an S shape. Over time, as our spine develops arthritis, some of these curvatures, including the coronal view and the sagittal view, may change. That may happen from a variety of different reasons. Let's say, as a young adult, you lean over and pick up something heavy and you injure the disc in your back. That injury may be off to the right side, and over time, the right side of that disc may asymmetrically collapse. The pain may be tolerable at the moment, but as the spine changes over time and as the disc asymmetrically collapses it puts abnormal stresses on certain parts of our back. A common misconception is that as an adult you don't grow so your spine curvature can't really change. That's not exactly true and like I tell my patients as we age our spine ages with us. Unfortunately in adults there are some things that can even accelerate that degenerative process. Some people have excessive wear and tear of their spine depending on their work or what they do with their life. Previous injuries to your back can also affect this process. And genetically speaking, you may have risk factors that cause arthritis to run in your family. And there are some other preventable risk factors that may help prevent this process, like carrying excess body weight and nicotine use. In our patient, he was a farmer and had excessive wear and tear of his spine over time. And in addition to that, he smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. So if you do that over a period of 30 years, it will certainly accelerate the degeneration of your back. Okay, enough about that. How do we fix it? I want you to know that treatments for adults and children are handled totally differently. That's why it's extremely important if you're even considering surgical intervention that you see a specialist in scoliosis. But before we get too carried away in terms of talking about surgery, are there any other conservative options that exist? In his case, he had exhausted almost all means of conservative treatment over the years, including physical therapy, medications, activity modifications, injections, chiropractic treatments, bracing, you name it, he had tried it. And like like I said before, he had even had other smaller types of back surgery that didn't help him. He could also consider neuromodulation options, including spinal cord stimulation, but given his young age, the amount of deformity that he had, in addition to the weakness that he had in his leg, I felt that this would not be the best option. We outweighed the risks and benefits of surgical correction of his scoliosis. What I really want you to know is that even as spine surgeons, we use geometry a lot. There are many types of different angles that we have to calculate in order to even begin to think about correcting someone's scoliosis and having them walk upright. I won't get into the logistics of how we calculate all these different types of angles because it's really out of the scope of this video. 
He not only had an extreme curvature of his lumbar spine looking at him straight on, but he also had a very straight spine when you looked at him from the side. We had to take all of that into account when trying to figure out how we would correct this. The point that I do want to make is that different surgeons recommend treating these types of curvatures in different ways and not saying that one way is better than the other. I often joke in spine surgery that if you ask seven different surgeons the same case, you will get seven different answers. I chose to do his particular surgery in a staged fashion, meaning that we split up his surgery into three different types of operations. Three surgeries? But before I talk about that, I want to talk about one very important topic. We discussed beforehand that he would not have surgery unless he demonstrated nicotine cessation for three months. We also discussed the importance of maintaining being nicotine free after surgery. This is extremely important to point out because the failure of spinal fusion with nicotine use is over 50%. So I certainly don't want to set him up for failure and offer him surgery if we cannot get him nicotine free. There's so much risk that goes into this operation, so we want to make sure that the patient has the best outcome possible. That includes ensuring that the patient is nicotine free, has a healthy body weight, they're medically stable to undergo a big operation like this, and they have no signs of osteoporosis or weakness in their bones. We did the first two operations on the same day where we did an anterior lumbar inner body fusion of L4-5 and L5-S1. And then L3-4 and L2-3, we came laterally to do what's called a lateral inner body fusion. This is a great diagram that shows how we do it, but an anterior incision, we come through the patient's abdomen here, and a lateral, we come through the patient's side right here. And we can use different size angles of the spacers in here to achieve a great correction before and after to redevelop the patient's lordotic curve. And here you can see the patient's coronal correction by looking at them from the front to back. And I took the patient back to the operating room the next day to place screws from T10 down to his pelvis. Then we can use manipulations of the rod and angles that we calculate during the surgery to achieve this type of coronal correction. And after all is said and done, the patient went from this curvature to this curvature. These are great before and after pictures, but most importantly, when he stood up for the first time after his surgery, he cried because it was the first time that he was able to stand up without that right leg pain in a number of years. Remember, the reason why he had that right leg pain is because all of these right-sided nerves are crunched together because of his curvature. So by simply correcting the curvature, we indirectly remove that pressure off of those nerves in his back. I want to point out that I am giving a very simplistic overview of how we perform scoliosis operations. There is so much that goes into making these decisions both before and intraoperatively as well as postoperative care that is so important. Before I end this video, I want to point out a few facts. Nicotine use is bad for the spine, period. If you were diagnosed as an adolescent with scoliosis, please make sure you get checked on it as an adult. There are a wide range of non-operative treatments that can help you, but if what you're doing is not helping your symptoms, please talk to a specialist. And most importantly is there are so many different types of operations we can do to correct scoliosis, and one is not necessarily better than the other. Our patient did great. He is now over one year out from surgery and his pain is 95% improved. Another case of patient focused and compassionate care Remember that June is Scoliosis Awareness Month. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.